He has made a film and I want to talk to him about it. Donald joins me now uh, on the line uh, from Moscow, I think. Donald is a political analyst, host of the Revolution Report. Sounds like my kind of report and director of a new film eight years before. Donald, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, let's start with the film, if we may, uh, and tell us why you made it, how difficult it was to make, and what the uh, main points that you're bringing out in the film actually are. Hi there, George. Well, thanks again for having me on the show once again. Um, basically, I recorded this documentary film with, uh, in collaboration with international heavyweight champion Jeff Monson, who's an American, and he also has Russian citizenship. He's living here like me, and he's got uh, you know similar political views as as I and you. And we filmed this documentary basically throughout two thousand uh, th throughout twenty twenty one. We wanted to show people what was going on in this conflict that had really uh, been frozen in time that nobody in the West was really paying attention to anymore. I mean, they had heard a little bit about it in 2014 and 2015, obviously exclusively from the Ukrainian uh, point of view. But as we were filming this and we were editing the actual documentary, uh, the special military operation was launched. Uh, the uh, People's Republics in Donbass were recognized as independent by the Russian government. The whole situation changed. So we really had to change the kind of um, the kind of storyline we were going for. Now, by the time of its completion, it's actually become something a lot more important, I think, than what we were even planning on in the beginning. It's become a historical record to show people in the West why Russia launched this special military operation in the first place, because people that there are so many people in the west that think that russia just attacked its neighboring country in an unprovoked way i've seen even journalists from sky news bbc when they're doing interviews with russian foreign minister sergey lavrov they they continue to ask this question and he continues to give the same answer that you know this was not an unprovoked attack and what our documentary shows is primary source evidence that it was actually Ukraine that provoked this war in the first place. It's been waging a war against the Donbass people since 2014, when the neo-fascist backed coup, Euromaidan, came to power in Ukraine. And the People's Republics declared um, uh, their, their independence. And actually, People's Republics were also declared in Kharkov and Odessa at that time. What a lot of people don't know is that when Ukraine launched its so-called anti-terror op operation, which was basically just uh, you know, an attack on these civilians, mostly, that said they don't want to be part of this fascist-backed government anymore. Kharkov and Odessa, they were just violently re repressed by the state. And Lugansk and Donetsk were only able to hold a small portion of their territory. And they held that for, throughout these eight years. This documentary is called Eight Years Before, because it's about the uh, kind of abuse and constant artillery shelling that the Ukrainian military subjected these people to, as well as the kind of human rights abuses and literal torture that happened on the territory of Lugansk and Donetsk that was held by the Ukrainian military. So in this documentary, you can actually see the translated interviews we did with people who lived near the uh, line of confrontation, as it was called, before the special military operation was launched. They talk about how uh, Ukrainian snipers were just taking pot shots at civilians. One woman talked about how a Ukrainian tank just ran right th ran right into their village and started blowing stuff up and killing people. Like this is kind of crazy stuff that you would never hear in the mainstream media. And they, they never they never talked about it back then in the we in the Western media. They don't talk about it now. So people can see this um, this kind of side that has not been available to people in the West in this documentary. It's still on YouTube, it hasn't been taken down yet. And there's also a lot about the actual evidence that points to the real existence of neo-Nazis in Ukraine. They are so much more widespread and powerful than the Western media and Western politicians say. Just because Zelensky is Jewish doesn't mean <laughs> that Ukraine is not uh, does not have a government that's basically propped up by these violent armed neo-Nazis. 
So that's basically the main con. Those that's are basically uh, the main yeah. Uh, that's actually the point I wanted to uh, take you to. Not everyone in Ukraine is a Nazi. Not everyone in the Ukrainian army is a Nazi. Right. Not everyone in the Ukrainian government is a Nazi. But those Nazis that there are, and they are plentiful and widespread and powerful, were all on this line of confrontation. Uh, hence, in, in Mariupol, uh, the battle was against a literal Nazi uh, regiment, the Azov uh, regiment. Do they feature in your documentary? Yeah, we definitely talk about them. Uh, and like you said, I mean, these these armed neo-Nazis, uh, like you said, they, they are, were and still are really the most ferocious uh, pro-Kiev fighters against Russia, against the Donbass People's Republics. Of course, like you said, again, uh, you know, not all Ukrainians are fascists. Of course, there are actually probably many, many Ukrainians that aren't so happy about the Kiev's role uh, in in what they've done in Donbass and what they've done against uh, the, you know, in, in terms of uh, being so hostile to Russia throughout these eight years as well. But Zelensky has banned all political opposition. These people cannot really speak out at all uh, un unless they're going to be really repressed by these neo-Nazi groups that are, um, you know, doing most of the fighting there as well. But actually, I, I talk about the Azov Battalion, but I don't focus so much on them because I feel like Azov the Azov Battalion has been hyper-focused on in the Western media as sort of, uh, you know, just the, the only neo-Nazi organization in the Ukrainian military that's actually significant, and they try to play them down. But I actually talk about all of these other neo-Nazi armed organizations that you just never hear of in the Western media that exist, and they have committed crimes as well. I talk about, there's the IDAR Battalion, there's the Donbass Battalion, there's the C-14 Militia, there's uh, um, there's Trident, there's all, there's so many neo-Nazi militias. Some of them have have literally had like prison torture, prisons for torture that were only discovered once the Russian military moved into these liberated territories. So I talk about a number of those in the documentary as well to give people a bigger idea that it's not just Azov, but there are really tons of neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian military. And one more thing interesting about them, uh, you know, not the entire, it's not the entire Ukrainian military that's fascist. There are also people conscripted into the military. There's many thousands of them that are forced to fight. And many times they're sent to the front with the neo-Nazi battalions put behind them as barrier battalions. So if these conscripts retreat, they're shot or arrested. That's another interesting thing. Indeed. Uh, and as you say, events have turned your film from an important but historic documentary, a documentary about history, into being one about current events. This is a current events documentary that people really should watch on YouTube. Uh, one of the aspects that struck me today, uh, you may be familiar with the charge of the Light Brigade and the a British role in the Crimean War. It turns out that it was Britain that attacked Crimea uh, just uh, in the last week. Uh, the British are back in Crimea, though this time not quite uh, so gallant in the charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, tell us about this internationalization of the conflict that I spoke about in my introduction. This is really no longer a war between Russia and Ukraine, is it? No, of course not. And I think really from even even from the beginning, and I think you mentioned that in the program as well, I mean, the West and NATO has been involved in backing the Euromaidan uh, coup d'etat, but definitely they are much more involved now than they ever have been. Uh, of course, we heard about the drone attack on the Russian Black Sea fleet that was trying to uh, basically make sure that these UN uh, grain corridors, the, the grain corridors that were supposed to be safe under the UN brokered grain deal to make sure that poor countries can get grain uh, from Ukraine specifically so that there's not a food crisis. Um, these Russian ships that were trying to assure the security there were attacked by Ukrainian drones. And this, according to the Russian defense ministry, was carried out 
by um, or was assisted by British intelligence. So this is just one of the more recent uh, episodes of Western involvement here that we've seen. But of course, there's tons, there, there's many, many more examples. I mean, just the fact that this uh, the, the Ukrainian military's fighting capacity has been completely turned around by the massive influx of Western weapons going to the Ukrainian military. As you mentioned earlier in the program, again, United States troops are now on Ukrainian soil. This is for the first time since the beginning of Russia's special military operation when they uh, left Ukraine uh, early on, and now they're back. Uh, and like they, like you said earlier, they say that they're here to protect Western weapons, but it's interesting that they've decided to come now because Western weapons have been here for a long time. And it's kind of worrying because there's so much rhetoric and also actions by the West, specifically the United States, connected to nuclear war right now. I mean, uh, also Norway just uh, put its military on high alert, and Russia called that a provocation. We keep seeing, we keep hearing statements from American officials saying that they don't have any evidence that Russia is planning on using a tactical nuclear weapon or anything, because really Moscow is not planning to do something like that. And yet we see the United States continue to move its nuclear weapons and nuclear capable uh, infrastructure closer and closer to Russia. So this is this is the the West is obviously completely involved in from you know matters of a potential nuclear war to basically sustaining the Ukrainian military with the continued flow of arms as well as intelligence support that's really important as well because the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkov just last month I think it was or uh, a month and a half ago. That was completely that, that success completely relied on U.S. intelligence helping them organize that. I uh, I have not been worried about the NATO armies because I know how uh, how weak they are. You know, the Netherlands armed forces are not going to fight anybody. And neither are most of the armed forces of most of the countries of NATO. But I don't mean to be unkind, uh, but the British armed forces could all fit in to a single football stadium in England. I mean the army, the navy and the air force in one football stadium. Uh, so uh, I haven't been worried about them. But the NATO country that is now massively involved in Ukraine is Poland, which of course once itself occupied very substantial parts of what is now Ukraine. Thanks to the Soviet Union, it's now Ukraine. It would still be in Poland if not right. uh, for that. Um, how, how dangerous is this increasing Polish involvement in your view? Well, I think it's uh, it's it's seriously worrisome, especially because, you know, Poland essentially has a military presence in Ukraine right now. I mean, they're mostly mercenaries, or at least that's what they're saying. But let's not forget, we've been hearing a lot of statements from Polish politicians as well recently saying that they're looking to lay claim once again on a lot of territories that they lost in World War II. So... It's interesting to to try and think about what's going to happen after this conflict is over. Are those? It's not going to be so easy to get rid of these Polish um, troops on Ukrainian territory if they're not willing to leave. That could be a serious problem as well, especially Pol if Poland decides it's going to use the fact that it's a NATO state in the in the event that Russia wins this conflict. It's they could potentially say we're not going to move our troops. What are you going to do? We're a member of NATO. So that that I think uh, could lead to a, a bigger confrontation as well, especially because I think it's really these super nationalist states on the border of Russia that are far more dangerous in terms of the possibility of a third world war than the United States, for example. I think the United States wants this conflict to go on for as long as possible so that they can basically give Russia as much of a bloody nose as they possibly can in the process of the conflict. But based on what we've seen in Ukraine and based on what we know about Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Poland as well, 
I don't know. I think uh, some of these hyper nationalists in Eastern Europe would be willing to go to war with Russia. Now, uh, tell us uh, again how people can see the film, Donald. Well, you can check it out on YouTube for as long as it's there at the Revolution Report. But we've also got a website that no matter what happens to the YouTube channel, it's going to be on our website. You can find it at the-revolution-report.com. Look forward to it. Hope everyone checks it out. Donald Corter, thanks for joining us.